Praise be Jesus and Mary. Amen. We're going to continue our reflection on the Ten Commandments today, continuing on the Sixth Commandment, and we'll speak of the heart of this commandment, which is to embrace by far the most countercultural virtue. The heart of the Sixth Commandment, which is you shall not commit adultery, is the call, the vocation to chastity. Vocation comes from the word vocare in Latin. It means to call. God calls you to be holy, and a big part of that holiness is living chastely. Chastity is the virtue that moderates the desire for sexual pleasure, according to what our faith and right reason teach us. Everyone is called by God to live a chaste life. So not just priests and religious. Priests, religious, single people, married people, young people, old people, everyone. The Catechism at paragraph 2348 says, All the baptized are called to chastity. All Christ's faithful are called to lead a chaste life in keeping with their particular state of life. Chastity is a double blessing in the sense that it's a virtue, but it's also a gift as well. A gift from God, the Catechism says at paragraph 2345, a grace, a fruit of spiritual effort. The Catechism at paragraph 2337 says that chastity, quote, involves the integrity of the person and the integrity of the gift of sexuality. So a person who's chaste is a person of integrity. Christian counselor June Hunt says that being a person of integrity means being the same in the dark as you are in the light. The word itself, integrity, means whole, undivided, and void of hypocrisy. Paragraph 2338 of the Catechism says that the chaste person tolerates neither a double life nor duplicity in speech. So chastity is really beautiful because... It's good and it's pure. The boring person is the unchaste person, not the chaste person. Pope John Paul II said that only the chaste man and the chaste woman, woman are capable of true love. And he's right about that. The chaste person brings light and life to their relationships. The unchaste person very easily drains the life out of their relationships like a leech drains the blood out of its victims, right? The unchaste person focuses on what they can get from others. The chaste person focuses more on what they can give. It's a totally different way of living. The book of Sirach, Sirach 26, 15 says, no balance can weigh the value of a chaste soul. In other words, they really are priceless people. A chaste person is a person of integrity because they know how to practice self-control, which is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. They know how to practice self-control. They know how to moderate the disordered desire for pleasure that we all have. They know how to say no to themselves. No, because they fear and honor the Lord. No, because they know what's truly good for others. No, because they truly know what's good for themselves, too. A chaste person has respect for themselves and for others. Those who are unchaste really don't respect themselves, as they should, and they tend not to respect others either. They tend to focus more on external looks rather than on internal character. They much more easily see others as objects of pleasure to be used and discarded at will rather than seeing other people as Persons created in the image of God, persons desirous and deserving of love and care and respect. For example, those who are in favor of contraception and abortion. Do you think most of those people are chaste, or do you think maybe most of them are unchaste? Right, the unchaste soul devalues life, devalues sexuality, and they devalue the human person in general. A chaste person is also someone who's reached a certain level of maturity in life. The word mature in Greek, as we've noted many times before, is the word teleos, which means perfect. Jesus said, be perfect, teleos, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We read that Matthew 5, 48. 
It can also be translated as be mature as your heavenly Father is mature. Being unchaste and immature and self-centered all tend to go hand in hand. The Catechism at paragraph 2339 says that chastity includes an apprenticeship in self-mastery, which is a training in human freedom. So to live chastely is actually to live freely. Chastity brings freedom. Paragraph 2342 adds that self-mastery is a long and exacting work, so Rome wasn't necessarily built in a day, right? And very often self-control and self-mastery require time, effort, grace, and perseverance. The alternative to that, says the Catechism, is clear. Either man governs his passions and finds peace, or he lets himself be dominated by them and becomes unhappy. Remember, our Lord says that everyone who commits sin is what? Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin, he said in John 8, 34. So we live, we are living in a slave culture today. So many people are slaves to their passions, slaves to sin against sins against chastity. There are far more slaves in the U.S. today than there ever were any time before the Civil War. Far more slaves also in the Western world, in the Western culture, than we really understand. When we're unchaste, when we sell ourselves into slavery, essentially that's what we're doing. Slavery to sin, slavery to the devil himself. St. Dominic said that a man who governs his passions is master of the world. Whereas St. Augustine said that lust indulged becomes habit, and habit unresisted becomes necessity, unquote. Right? That's so sad, right, when you think about that. So day by day, we either build ourselves up spiritually or we tear ourselves down. And sexual sin tears so many people down spiritually and even emotionally and psychologically as well. Paragraph 2339 of the Catechism says that man gains or grows in personal dignity, quote, when ridding himself of all slavery to the passions, he presses forward to his goal, meaning eternal life, by freely choosing what is good and by his diligence and skill, effectively secures for himself the means suited to this end. So what are the means, what are the tools for living a chaste life? Actually, the Catechism mentions five of them, paragraph 2340. It says, five tools for leading or means for leading a chaste life. One, self-knowledge. Two, practice of asesus, adapted to the situations that you face. Three, obedience to God's commandments. Four, exercise of the moral virtues. Five, fidelity to prayer. Let's briefly look at each of those. First, self-knowledge. That means that you have to know your strengths and your weaknesses. You have to avoid people, places, situations, things that are near occasions of sin for you, meaning that if I'm actually near that person or place or situation or thing, I'm easily led into sin. All near occasions of sin, whatever the sin is, need to be avoided whenever possible. So if your iPhone is a near occasion of sin to you, Jesus might tell you to cut it off, actually, right? Better to enter heaven device-free than to be cast into hell, body, soul, and iPhone all together. We have to be careful about some of these things. Self-knowledge also means not having too much confidence in myself either. Realizing that I'm just as susceptible to falling into sin as the next person. So by knowing myself and my weaknesses, that helps me to be wise about the decisions that I make in order to live chastely. Next, the Catechism talks about practicing asesus, which is an uncommon word. It means ascetical practices, so self-discipline, denying yourself. An uncommon word for perhaps an all too uncommon practice. If you want to be chaste, you need self knowledge. You also need self discipline, too. When you deny your senses and deny yourself in seeking comforts and pleasures, then it becomes much more easy to say no to unchaste thoughts and unchaste actions. Many people are caught up 
in the habitual sins of the flesh because of a general problem with self-indulgence. They have trouble saying no to themselves and to their impulses. A basic principle of the spiritual life is that you have to say no to selfishness, no to self, in order to say yes to God, in order to say yes to others as well. Thirdly, the Catechism says that obedience to God's commandments helps you to live a chaste life. So the less you sin in the other areas of your life, the less you'll be inclined to fall into unchaste thinking and unchaste actions. When sins of the flesh are compulsive, there might actually be psychological problems or immaturity problems attached to them as well. Perhaps we'll talk more about that when we specifically deal with certain sins. Fourthly, the Catechism says, practicing moral virtues is a great help to living a chaste life. For example, impurity and violence tend to go hand in hand with a good number of people. So the more someone learns to say, not to know to being controlled by feelings of anger, the freer they'll be in their work for acquiring the virtue of temperance, which controls lustful passions. The moral virtues work on putting reason in control of your feelings. They help put order into my disorder. Right? It's better to have faith and reason behind the wheel in the car. Right? When feelings and emotions are behind the wheel, then we're in for a lot of trouble. Feelings and emotions need to be strapped into those child safety seats in the back seat, right? They don't need to be running around in the car or on the wheel or on the gas pedal. Lastly, if you want to have freedom and joy in, in, this, in this life and live a chaste life, you need to pray. Prayer is the biggest and the best help. It's also maybe perhaps the most neglected help. Jesus says, ask and I'll help you. A lot of times we don't take him up on that offer. Prayer is my relationship with the Lord. So if my prayer life is strong and constant and unfaithful to spending quality and quantity time with the Lord every day, then the pull towards sexual sin will lessen. If my prayer life is spotty and superficial and it's not a priority to me, then the devil is going to unbuckle those children in the back seat and have them wreak havoc in your car. Prayer is huge if we want to have and to hold on to the virtue and the gift of chastity. So let's ask Our Lady today for the grace to be chaste in an unchaste world so that we can love as she loves and as God loves, so that we can love with a pure, life-giving heart. Praise be Jesus and Mary.